Thanks very much, John, and thank you everyone for coming in the room or online. I'm just going to start by uh, thanking uh, the European Union for its generous funding of this research project, which, as John said, was funded by the European Union's Marius Kudowska Curie Actions Program, and also echoing his thanks to those who've um, enabled me to study the original tablets in the National Archaeological Museum, in particular, uh, Katerina Vutsa, uh, curator at the museum. Just a quick introduction to uh, show you what the kinds of texts I'm going to be talking about today look like. These are the Linear B tablets. They are written in the Linear B writing system in a uh, dialect of Greek, which we call Mycenaean. They are small clay tablets. All of these would fit um, fairly comfortably in one hand. Um, and they record administrative information of interest to the Mycenaean palaces and administrative centers of late Bronze Age, Crete and mainland Greece. So to give you kind of an idea of the sorts of topics we're talking about, these three texts from Pylos uh, list, uh, respectively a work group, this one here of uh, some men and boys working for the palace, uh, a record of some olive oil being uh, given to a perfume manufacturer, and a record of contributions of wine coming from various places in the territory of Pylos. The site I'm going to be talking about, Pylos, is located in southwestern Greece in the area of Messenia, and this map shows you uh, both Pylos and the locations of other um, centers where linear B administrative documents have been found. Those in red have the largest collections of tablets. And one of the reasons for choosing Pylos is that it um, has the second largest collection of linear B documents after Knossos on Crete, which has the largest. Pylos has uh, produced about a thousand tablets, or that includes the complete tablets like the ones you just saw and much more fragmentary ones. The second reason is that nearly all of the tablets from Pylos um, can be dated to the time of the, the palace's final destruction. Um, they are stratified within the kind of destruction layer of the palace, which burned down sometime around probably 1200 or 1180 BCE. Um, not only are they therefore like very closely contemporary in archaeological terms, because Linear B documents are fairly short term documents, um, they're not dated um, any more precisely than either listing month names or saying that something happened this year or last year. They therefore seem really to have only been kept for the length of a yearly administrative cycle in most cases. So tablets that were effectively fired in the structure of the palace were probably all written within the year preceding that time. And so with the exception of a few possibly earlier tablets that I won't be talking about, at Pylos we have the products of a single contemporary community of practice, which offers kind of the best prospects of any person in sight to be studying um, a question like writing practices and how these people are kind of working and interacting with each other. Just a bit more introduction to Pylos, here is the plan of the palace. Um, and you can see there are various different locations where tablets have been found. Most of them were found in the so-called archives complex, two rooms immediately next to the palace's main entrance. And this is it's called the archives complex because we know that tablets were, were brought here for kind of storage and filing. Although, as I said, not in a sort of long-term way like a modern archives would be. But there are other locations around the palace, for example, storerooms or places where uh, goods are being brought in uh, from outside the palace or you know, distributed to people where texts are being written and, and also kept at least for some period of time. Who are the people who are writing these texts? Well, we have between about 30 and 40 different writers who have been identified at Pylos. And this identification um, has largely been done on the basis of handwriting analysis or paleography. Other factors of writing practice, such as spelling, text format, content, and so on, also play a role, but handwriting has generally been the primary factor. So on the right, there's a, an illustration of a paleographic chart showing the forms of signs used by uh, one particular hand at Pylos, hand 21, in this case. As John said, these writers or scribes, as they're often known, remain pretty anonymous. They don't sign their work. Um, we don't have texts that talk about scribal work. We don't know the Mycenaean word for a person who writes, for example. Um, we don't have any certain kind of text to do with schooling, although we have a couple of possibilities. This is one text from Knossos that has been argued to be a schooling text on the grounds that it has the same text written on both the front and the back with what looked like some differences in handwriting. It's been argued that one of these is the teacher and one of these is the pupil copying the teacher. 
um, I'm a little bit skeptical about arguments that depend on seeing one of these as being kind of better writing than the other, because that seems to be fairly subjective, but, you know, teachers writing out texts for people to copy is often a feature of sort of education text, so it's a possibility, but it's one text and it's from Knossos, it's not terribly helpful. So the, the main aim of my current project and also my, my ongoing research um, that I've been working on really ever since my PhD is trying to use the what little evidence we have, which is the text that these writers wrote to understand more about them and their practices and their decisions that they're making in the course of creating their documents. I should say at this point um, that the question of scribal identification at Pylos is currently somewhat controversial. Um, the paleographic chart on the screen I've taken from Thomas Palima's 1988 work, The Scribes of Pylos. More recently, there have been several new editions and works about the scribes, all of which have kind of proposed various changes to Palima's system. Uh, some differing more than others in kind of what hands they're identifying and how they're numbering them. This, for example, is the reason that I can't give a very definite number as to how many hands there are because the number varies a bit depending on who you ask. I'm not gonna get into that too much. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this a bit in the second half of the talk when I talk about handwriting, but for the most part, I'm gonna be concentrating on the areas where people broadly agree rather than the areas where they disagree and things are more difficult. Because in fact, the majority, even if the majority of identifications, even if the numbering might be slightly different between editions, kind of broadly, actually, people tend to agree more than they disagree, I think. So the first half of this talk, I'm going to be talking about um, spelling and what the way that uh, writers of Pylos spell can tell us about how they were trained um, to write. To do this, we need to have a bit of an introduction to how the linear B writing system works. This is the um, phonographic component of the linear B script, so the part that's used to represent the sounds of the language, which is what we're concerned with when we're talking about spelling. As you can see it's divided into several different parts. Um, if we look at the core group of signs, um, you can see that these all stand for syllables, and not just syllables, but open syllables, that is syllables that end in a vowel. So there are five um, plain vowel signs, A, E, I, O, U, and then series of signs for a consonant followed by each of those vowels. We also have the extra signs, which you can see aren't quite as systematically arranged as the core signs. They have some different structures. There are signs for two consonants plus a vowel like dwe. We'll talk a lot more about these because they are one of the main sources of spelling variation that kind of systematically exists within the writing system. Then there are the undeciphered signs, uh, which I'm not gonna talk about because they're undeciphered, so we can't really talk about their use in spelling at this point. We also need to talk a bit about linear B spelling rules because um, partly due to the structure of the script and partly due to just kind of orthographic choices that were made in developing the writing system, there are a lot of ambiguities in how linear B is used to represent the Mycenaean Greek language, leading to, if you look at some transcribed linear B and then you look at the Kind of phonetic interpretation of that, they often will look quite different from each other. Uh, one of the main sources of ambiguity is that uh, similar, phonetically similar consonants are often represented with one series, one single series of signs. So the, the velar consonants, which are produced at the back of the mouth, K, an aspirated K, so like K with a puff of air after it, and G are all represented by one single series of signs that we conventionally transcribe as K. Same goes for the labials P, aspirated P, B, all transcribed just P, and the dentals T and TH both transcribed T, although there is a separate series for the voice dentals D, and there is a special extra sign that we will talk about a bit later, put to, which represents the aspirated P followed by a U. So just an example of transcription, um, we would transcribe the sequence of two signs given here, pass C, and then in some context interpret that as pass C, he or she says with that aspirated P. Similarly, R and L are not distinguished in the script um, despite both existing in the language and we transcribe them conventionally as R. So the word that we transcribe re u ko is lukos white. We'll come back to where the S is gone in a second. And H is also a sound that exists in Mycenaean Greek but is not usually represented in writing except for sometimes the use of another extra sign A2 which represents specifically ha. So the word parwaha cloths, the, the ending ha can be represented just by a plain A sign and you have to 
understand the presence of the H, or it can be represented by this unambiguous sign A2. Another source of kind of potential spelling difficulties is inherent in the structure of the script, namely all of the, <coughs> excuse me, all of the signs of the script stand for open syllables. Greek is a language with a lot of syllables that end in consonants, closed syllables, and a lot of consonant clusters. So multiple consonants in a row, not followed by a vowel. What do you do when you want to represent something like that with a script whose signs will represent consonant plus a vowel? Well, you either leave out some of the consonants in so-called partial spelling. So the first consonant in a cluster or a word final consonant is not represented. So we already saw that with reu ko, lu kos, right? Um, an example of how this can cause potential difficulties of interpretation, that sequence pas si can also represent pan si, the dative plural of the word all, so for everyone, with the n omitted. But you can also choose to represent that consonant, and then you have to do so with a sign containing a vowel that is not going to be pronounced, a dummy vowel. So the initial tri at the beginning of the word tripos, meaning tripod, is spelled out ti ri. The smur in the middle of dosmos, a kind of religious contribution, is spelled somo. And then we have some more of the extra signs, um, so-called complex signs, things like pte, duo, that represent those consonant clusters just in a single sign. So the word ptelewas, made of elm, could be spelt out pete in that cleanly spelling, but could be spelt with just this complex sign for pte. So we've seen just in this kind of fairly brief survey of how the linear B orthographic system works to represent Mycenae in Greek, that there is some variation kind of built into this system, right? We have the alternation of a or a2 to represent ha, the alternation of pete or pete to represent pete. Uh, here's an example as well, which has three different ways of spelling the same sequence, right? The sequence dwo in the middle of this name with dwohios can be spelled dowo, normal Pliny spelling. It can be spelled dwo with an extra sign, but you can also spell it duo, taking the vowel of the dummy vowel of that sequence from the following W, a semi vowel, rather than from the following vowel as is normal. So, in principle, we've got all this potential for variation. But the question I wanted to look at was how does this vari variation actually appear in practice in the work of individual writers and across the whole community of writers working at Pylos? Now, this has already been the subject of an article by the mycenologist Yves Duhu in 1986, The Teaching of Orthography at Mycenae and Pylos, which kind of was looking at some of the same questions that I'm asking now. Um, and this is one of his figures showing, you know, he went through the various different um, orthographic variation options that are available to see which scribes would use which options. And his conclusion based on this was that you can find two different training groups who, who, share, who make different orthographic choices, or each group will share more choices with other members of that group than with members of the second separate group who may have been trained by a different person, you know, and in a slightly different orthographic tradition. So according to De Who, Hans, you know, you can see here, Hans one and two share a lot of the choices that he's labeled with this kind of code that doesn't matter for these purposes. And, they also share a lot with hand 21, whereas they, they shared rather fewer with 41 and 43. And so we've got these two different training groups. However, if we go back to this table, um, an awful lot of these little boxes showing which scribe uses which variant have more than one little symbol, like a line or a cross in them. And that means that the scribe uses more than one of the possible spelling options. And that was something I was interested to dig into. Why, if we've got these two different sort of training groups, are we actually seeing quite a lot of individual variation within the work of a single person? So when I started looking into this, into the distribution of these different uh, orthographic options, I found three main patterns. The first one was places where there seems to be a fairly strong group preference, even though um, variation is, is possible in principle and maybe is found at other sites. It doesn't seem to happen or, or very rarely happens at Pylos as far as we can see. So this sign Pate that we've already met is an example of this. Um, Pate is found 33 times at Pylos in the work of eight different writers. And that doesn't sound like very much, but for one of the extra signs, it's a pretty good rate of attestation, really. Um, we're talking very small data sets here most of the time. So it comes up in words like diptera hide or rapteres leather workers. 
whereas we only have one possible example of the sequence pete being used as a Pliny spelling to represent this pete sequence. And that's in a personal name, which to be honest, we can't interpret. It could be something like aptus, but it could easily be arpatus or ampatus or goodness knows what else. Names are not terribly reliable most of the time when it comes to etymological interpretation. So that's at best a possible example. Um, I don't know that there's strong enough evidence to say that it's a rule at Pylos that you can only use pte, the extra sign for this purpose, but it certainly seems to be a fairly strong preference based on the evidence that we have. In other cases, um, we still have a preference, but it's a little bit less strong and there's a bit more variation going on. Uh, so for this, we're gonna look at the sign per two, which as I said, represents the aspirated P specifically, whereas remember the core sign poo might be P or aspirated P or B. And this extra sign is used by nine or 10 writers that we can pretty confidently identify. Um, but we have a few examples of uh, writers who we can identify as using the core sign poo to represent this same phonetic sequence. Now, obviously it's difficult to identify this for certain sometimes because of the inherent ambiguity, but one way in, in the way the core signs work, but one way we can do this pretty reliably is if we have spelling alternations where we can see the same word, you know, the exact same word spelled in different ways. So we have an adjective that uh, refers to a group of people, so-called ethnic adjective, which can be spelled apuka or aputuka by two different writers. Or we have a man's name, which is probably referring to the same person, something like putias maybe, which is spelled with a pu or a putu, again, by different people. So we might have some individual preferences going on here, maybe. Maybe some writers prefer to um, use one spelling and, and some writers prefer to use another. We have at least one case of a writer who has quite happily used both, and that's Han 15, who we will see has come up in both lists and is in bold. And in fact, their examples uh, come up in the same tablet and in fact in adjacent words in a single entry. Here is this person's name, Putia, spelled with a Pu, and here is this place name, Aputuwe, with a Putu, meaning this person P at this place A. It's not very informative as an entry. So at least for this one writer and potentially for more for whom we don't necessarily have the evidence to say so very confidently, variation between these two is quite normal, even if overall there might be a preference. And then we have the cases where variation is just entirely normal across the whole group and within the work of individual writers. And for this, we're gonna look at sequences of the kind um, that we talked about when we saw this name with Dwohi else being spelled with a Dawa, a Duwa, or a Dwa. So a sequence of a consonant plus a W plus a vowel where there may be up to three possible ways to spell them. It's not always the case because there isn't always one of these extra signs available. So the sequence que, for example, is found in this adjective whose meaning we're not totally sure of is both kewe and kuwe, but there isn't an extra sign there. Now there's not a huge amount of data if you only look at each of these sequences individually, but if we put them all together, because they are phonetically similar sequences that are also orthographically similar, we can get a bit more data to play with. So hence why I've got this whole range of dwe, kwe, nwe, swe, and twe, followed by different vowels to look at. So if we look at um, examples of all of these different sequences, um, this is what we see if we look at the writers who have more than five um, examples that we can identify of this kind of sequence. Again, there may well be more that we can't identify with certainty at the moment. And initially, just looking at the overall table, the impression is one of quite a lot of variation, right? Um, and two, for example, has used both the regular type of Pliny spelling, things like dewe, kewe, Niwi, and also the kind with a U, duwa, tuwa, kuwe. Um, hand one has used all three spellings just as a sequence, dwa, dawa, duwa, dwa. Um, hand 21 looks quite consistent in the case of, for example, tuwa, five examples of tuwa. Maybe that's an individual preference. But if we look across the whole row, there's not a consistent preference for this kind of spelling with a U. We've got dewe, kawa, Noir. We've got all three different kinds of spellings attested across the whole group, even if one of them is looking quite consistent. So the only real exception to this is hand 43 at the bottom, who has got five examples and they're all extra size, right? Four twas and one noir. This might be an indication of this hand sort of preferring this spelling, but on the other hand, five examples is not very many. And 
also this is obviously the easiest kind of example to identify because the extra signs unambiguously represent these consonant clusters, whereas the pleated spellings are ambiguous. So this might be something or it might be just an artifact of what the data is like. If we look now at the writers who have fewer examples, um, obviously the ones with one example are not useful in this respect, um, but we can see that even those with between two and four examples have quite often used more than one spelling. Han 41 has written both duwa and dwa. Han 26 has probably written both dewa and dwe. Han 32 only has two examples and they are different spellings of the same nwa sequence. So looking at this again and looking at what spelling variants are attested in the work of each writer, but in the context of the number of examples they have, which is not completely directly correlated to the number of texts we know they've written, but is you know, fairly well correlated to that for obvious reasons. This doesn't look like two separate training groups learning and using slightly different orthographic options to me. This looks to me like a single training group, which has been taught that in certain circumstances, particularly where these extra signs exist, variation is both permissible and a normal thing to do. Um, we get different patterns of um, variation kind of coming out of pylos, obviously, and those might differ in some respects from what we see at other sites. And that might be a function of training, um, but it might equally be a function of kind of you know, preferences or habits forming amongst a group in a rather less official way than training implies, right? A group of people working together, a community of practice can share ideas and learn things and pick things up kind of from each other as they work, as well as when they're doing whatever the Mycenaean equivalent of sitting in a classroom, listening to someone talk is. Now, having seen this pattern of kind of variation being, as I said, totally normal in some of these circumstances where it's allowed, I wanted to look at what factors might be influencing that. I mean, in English orthography, for example, um, the representation of any given phonetic sequence can be extremely variable, um, but it's always consistent. You know, we always spell a given word the same way in our standardized writing system. So is that the case in uh, linear B? Well, we have a few examples where it looks like people are consistently spelling the same term in one apparently preferred way. I don't have a huge number of kind of great examples for this, but for example, there's this adjective meaning people from a place called Tinwato. And it has a bit of linguistic variation going on, which um, is not relevant to the orthography, but you can get it Tinwasiya or Tinwatiya. Um, despite that, though, it's always spelled with this extra sign Nwa, and that's seven times in at least four different writers. Again, it's not huge numbers, but it's not nothing. Or we have Han Tu, who four or five times writes the adjective Perusin one last years, and that's always spelt with a new wa, never a no wa. So maybe these are some of those, you know, group preferences for the spelling of particular words in the way that we seem to have a pile of group preference for the spelling, um, you know, with pte, for example. Um, on the other hand, we have other terms where you get the same word spelled different ways. Once again, um, Always my favorite example, Widwahios, whose name is spelled in three different ways by three different people. So maybe these three different writers each have their own preference about how to spell this guy's name. Uh, they haven't written it more than once each, I don't think, so we're not totally sure. But then we also have examples where even the same word is spelled different ways by the same person. So this adjective that we saw that's parakewe or parakuwe, those are both written by hand too. Those two examples in hand 32 where the only two relevant examples that hand has are spelled differently. They're actually again in the same words, different grammatical forms, but both Perusinua last years. So what does this tell us about training? Well, as I've already discussed, the training system in cases where variation is kind of allowed within the system is teaching that variation as both permissible and a normal thing to do. And it's important to stress that this is a minority of linear V spelling rules that allow this variation in the first place. In most of what I was talking about at the beginning, most of the strategies that are used to represent different um, consonant clusters, for example, that's generally highly consistent, both within Pylos and across all the different Mycenaean sites and the different time periods um, that their tablets date to. Um, so it's a relatively restricted part of the 
orthographic system that allows this variation, but where that's allowed, it's fine. Um, sometimes at PyLOS, we can see that either some preferences are being taught at that site or they are developing kind of more organically for the group of writers or for individuals. And it's not often easy to pick that apart because of the amount of data that we've got. Moreover, this training seems to largely or entirely be not in how to spell particular words, but in how to spell particular phonological sequences. The writers of pilots do not seem to be memorizing word lists in the way that, for example, scribal training in some contemporary Near Eastern cultures often uh, involves this. We know that because we have the word lists. Um, rather, they seem to be being taught, this is the way or these are the ways that you can spell this particular sequence. And then when they are writing, they are applying that knowledge kind of as they are working. And so we get people making different choices about how to spell things that could be spelled in more than one way, um, you know, as they go along. And that might be for a whole host of now unreconstructable reasons why you might choose one way over the other at any given moment. As John mentioned, this is the subject of an article that has uh, just appeared online in the Cambridge Classical Journal. So um, anyone who is interested is encouraged to check that out for kind of more details about all of this. For the second half of this talk, I want to move on to something that is very much more work in progress. Um, and that is thinking about handwriting. So I said at the beginning, handwriting is probably the main way that scribal identifications have been carried out. Here's one of those paleographic charts as a reminder of that. Now there's a longstanding kind of division of the writers at Pylos into three groups known as classes. Uh, this actually goes back to the first identification of scribal hands by Emma L. Bennett in the 1940s. Um, and then it was kind of reiterated in Palaima's The Scribes of Pylos. And according to this, we have these three classes and each of them are defined by their similarity in writing to a kind of key scribe, one of the ones with the most tablets. Um, so class one is writers whose handwriting looks similar to hand one. And that's originally numbers one through 15. Class two is writers similar to hand 21, numbers 21 through 34. Class three is writers similar to hand 41, 41 through 45. There's also, <clears throat> there's also class four, and that's a small group of texts which have been argued to be older, although I don't think there's any good archeological evidence for that. Um, and I won't be talking about that. As well as being a means of grouping writers in this way, uh, the classes have also been used as a means of attributing texts to a, to a general kind of group if there's not enough evidence to attribute them to a specific writer. So a particularly small or fragmentary text might be attributed to class one, meaning it looks a bit like class one writing, but there's not enough evidence to say whether it's by hand one or hand two or you know, somebody else entirely within that general group. Now I mentioned before that there are now uh, a lot of kind of different uh, ideas about attributions of hands at Pylos floating around. And this class system has also been kind of challenged as part of that. So in addition to renumbering some hands and identifying some new hands, some of the new additions dispense with the classes altogether. Some of them keep them. Um, but nobody really talked about this in any detail from a methodological standpoint. Um, nobody's really said, any given any reasons why they're keeping or not keeping these classes. Um, they, they've simply kind of either included them in the editions or left them out. The reason this is uh, relevant is that in addition to being this sort of paleographical tool, um, these classes have been argued by Polyma to be representing training groups. So in a similar sort of way to what we had with the possible orthographic training groups, um, these may be training groups representing pupils of one teacher who might be the kind of key scribe of each group, and one, 21, 41, who have taught a bunch of people to write, and so those people end up writing in a similar way. Obviously, if the classes are not being used anymore, that then removes the possibility of seeing that kind of training group at Pylos. But again, no one's really talked about that. Um, and so, what I've been trying to think about doing is how we can kind of reassess this and look at the possibility of, you know, do these classes represent, first of all, kind of paleographical realities 
do they in fact represent groups of writers who write more similarly to each other than to anybody else in a meaningful way that is useful for that kind of handwriting analysis? And then secondly, if so, does that then represent any kind of real life reality, right? In the sense of representing teaching in three different traditions and or by three different teachers? Or do we have a much more kind of fluid and varied system in the way that I think we do for orthography where actually people, you know, we have one tradition and there's a lot of variation with it. Again, for this, this part, I'm gonna be focusing on kind of the core hands, I guess you could say that most people agree on and the ones that were kind of originally attributed to these three different classes for the purpose of sort of just exploring this in a fairly preliminary way. Uh, my complete paleographic study is still very much in progress. So we're just gonna be looking at a few signs to kind of illustrate some of the issues involved in trying to think about this and, and some of the directions that we might need to go in or some of the things we might need to think about. Um, so we're gonna be thinking both about variation across the whole community of writers, but also again, individual variation, um, because of course the handwriting of any individual is always going to, to vary, you know, in, in different contexts, writing at different speeds and different materials and different sizes and, and different days of the week, you know. So I mentioned that this division actually goes back to Emmett L. Bennett in the 1940s. And Emmett L. Bennett's PhD thesis is also the only place that I have found where people actually specifically talk about the reasons they are dividing these hands into classes and like features of the signs that are different in the different classes and which signs are more important for that or less important for that. So I want to go back to what he says about this. And note this is in 1947, so this is pre-decipherment, and it is also before a lot of the Pylos tablets were even discovered, a lot of them were found in the 50s, so obviously it's not up to date, but nonetheless I think it's useful to kind of go back to understand the history of where this idea came from and see what the original conception of it was. And this is what Bennett says in his thesis. Classes one and three represent the two sets of basically different ideal forms. So like the kind of archetypal form someone would have in mind of a, of a sign. Class two includes those hands which have made some compromise. By that he means sometimes they would use a form that looks like class one of, of some signs and different signs that use a more class three looking form. So originally this is more of a two-way opposition along a spectrum than it is a three-way split into three separate groups, right? We have classes one and three who look different and we have class two in the middle. It's more like a sort of Venn diagram, um, which I think is important because we already have this, this slightly fuzzier and more overlapping idea of what a class might be. Um, then it might appear from just class one hands look like class, look like hand one and so on, right? So that kind of fuzziness and, and overlapping potentially between these classes, if, if the classes are a sort of useful reality to use, is, is what I want to fairly briefly look at with a few signs. So just to take one fairly straightforward example, um, the sign ka is a circle with a cross in it. And the main sort of significant piece of variation that you see in the sign is whether the writer draws the uh, horizontal part of the cross or the vertical part of the cross first. And what Emma Bennett says in his analysis is that class one hands mostly draw the horizontal first and class three hands mostly draw the vertical first. Again, note that mostly. Um, it's already not an absolute deal. If we look at this in the entire Pylos corpus, again, including a lot of tablets that were not available to, to Bennett at the time, we see that hands who draw always seem, or pretty consistently seem to draw the horizontal first are in classes one and two. Hands that uh, write the sign with the vertical first are in classes one, two, and three. So not a very firm distinction here between these two, these, these potential classes. And more than that, we've got several hands who use both. And some of them, the class one hands, one, one and two, mostly draw the horizontal first, but sometimes the other way around. Some class two and three hands, 21, 41, 43, mostly have the vertical first, but sometimes the other way around. And then a couple with no clear preference because they haven't got very many examples. Um, so even in this pretty straightforward sign, we have maybe some tendencies 
between these possible groupings, but we don't have anything terribly clear cut and we have a lot of individual variation. In addition, um, we have a really quite remarkably different form of a sign, which is used by a definitely one hand, it happens to be a class two hand, with this kind of wavy cross form. Um, and there are two other examples that whose attribution is, is debated. So we don't know if they're by hand 34 or by somebody else or to somebody else. So as well as this kind of relatively complex picture of variation in the kind of most usual form, we also have to deal with this one possibly unique form to one hand at this site and factor that into how we're thinking about how are people learning to write these forms of these signs? Where is this wavy form coming from? A couple more examples. Uh, the sign A is also pretty straightforward. It only really has one main form of variation. That's whether it has one horizontal crossbar or two, as you see. And again, this was something that, that Bennett used as a class distinguisher, um, class one, single crossbar, class three, double crossbar. Again, if we look at the distribution of these, we have hands that only ever seem to use the single form and they're in class one or class two. We have hands that only seem to use the double form and they're in all three classes. And we have hands that use both. And we have hands that mostly use the single form, but sometimes the double, hand one, the main scribe of class one. We have others who mostly use the double form, but sometimes the single and they're in class two and class three. And we have some more class two and three hands where it seems to be pretty much equal. They use them about 50% of the time. Um, so again, we can kind of see some tendencies. There's a kind of tendency in the class three towards the double. There's more of a tendency towards a single in the class one, perhaps, but it's not very clear cut, really. You'd need to dig much more into, you know, the statistics of it to get a, a proper idea of it. But this general broad brush outline, again, it's a bit complicated. This next sign D um, has two ways it can vary. Um, you can see here the top underneath the kind of main top line can have three horizontal lines or three vertical lines. And then the stem can be made of two strokes or one stroke. And both of these features can vary sort of semi-independently of each other. The horizontal, the top horizontal form is only found in class one and is in fact only found in three hands, one, two, and three, and only found at this site. It's a unique form to Pylos and to these three hands at Pylos. But two of them vary in whether they draw the stem with one stroke or two. So they're very consistent in one respect and variable in the other. And hand three only has one example. So I don't know if it would, if, if they would also vary in the stem. The vertical form, meanwhile, is found written by everybody else in all three classes. So there are other class one hands who don't use that distinctive horizontal form. And in addition, um, we do get a few examples, or a couple of examples of the vertical top with multiple strokes in the stem and even one unique example with three strokes, which is not, not certainly attributed, but might be class one. So again, we have a lot of complexity here increased by the fact that we have multiple different ways of variation that don't necessarily correspond to, to each other and a unique form that is only used by, as far as we know, one writer with these three strokes in the stem. Two slightly more complicated signs. Um, if we look at the top sign, meh. Um, looking at the first three examples, the main way this sign varies at Pylos, this sign is very variable across other sites, but at Pylos, the main way it varies is in what's happening at the sort of top right. You mostly have this kind of backwards S shape, which might then have one or two small vertical cross strokes. You can see that the, the first of these is also slightly different from the others in that it only has one vertical stroke on the left and not the extra horizontal. That's a unique form of this site. Every single other example of meh has that vertical plus horizontal on the left. So that's not terribly productive as a means of analysis apart from this, this one different example. So if we look at the distribution of that, we can see all three classes have the backwards S shape without anything else. There's no class one examples with the one or two crossbars, but there are both class two and class three. Um, but then we also have this unusual um, form, which is another one that's unique to Pylos, I think, which instead of this kind of backwards S has a C shape with another smaller semicircle inside it. 
And that's found in class one and class two, including hand 14, who has also apparently used the backwards S shape. So one single hand has used both the totally normal form of this site and one that's unique to this site and shared with a couple of other hands who are not belong, do not belong to its class under the, this analysis. This next sign, me, sort of basically has the form of a triangle with a little hook on the right. The left-hand side you can see is, is often kind of curved at the top, but sometimes it's just a straight line. That straight left-hand side is one that maybe has a class distinction at, at Pylos. We have only class one hands who use that. Whereas the curved one is found in all three classes. So again, we might have a tendency towards something in class one, but then the other form is distributed over all of them. What's inside the sign, inside that triangular bit, um, then varies quite a lot. You can have nothing, which is found in all three classes. You can have one curve or line, which is found in all three classes. And you can have two curves or line, which is found in all three classes. And those two curves or lines can be arranged in all sorts of different ways. And that varies to a great extent by the individual hand. If it's uh, we, here, we have a curve with a vertical inside it and two perpendicular lines, but you can have two parallel lines or all sorts of other forms. And in, in addition to these being found across all three of these class groups, hand one, the main scribe of class one, has used two of these different forms, and hand 41, class three, has used all of the different options, nothing, one stroke, two strokes. Last sign that I want to talk about is um, a very complicated one, as you can see from these drawings of six selected forms of the sign ne. Taking the simplest part, the way that it can vary first, it can have a baseline or it cannot have a baseline. Um, hands that consistently use the baseline seem to be only class three hands. Hands that consistently don't have a baseline appear in all three classes. And then there are hands that use it sometimes and then leave it off sometimes, and they again are in all three classes. The next way that this sign can vary is in the kind of arms at the top. The simplest form on the left, you can see you have a basically kind of symmetrical, like an S and a backwards S. Um, each of them is just usually drawn with one stroke. Um, the more complex ones, you have two strokes on the left, pretty much always the left, or in, one, in this case at the end, even, even three strokes on the left, one, two, three. And again, all of these features can vary more or less independently of each other. There are some tendencies as to what features turn up with, with other features, but you have to start by looking at them all separately. So the symmetrical arms, the slightly simpler form, class one and class two hands, those who use it consistently. The consistently using the double left arms, they're ascribed in all three classes. Using both forms, they're ascribed in class one and class two, including hand one and possibly also hand 21. That one's not certain. And then what's going on in the middle of the sign can also vary um, from the simplest, nothing at all, or one crossbar, or two crossbars, up to the most elaborate, a kind of triangular sort of chevron made of two strokes or a, a circle or loop, one or two strokes. Um, and again, we have writers from all three classes who will use nothing in this place. Um, those with crossbars seems to be limited to one or two, but the, the, the more elaborate chevron or curves in all three classes. And this includes individual scribes who use at least two, if not three options from here. So uh, class one and two writers, including hands one and hands two, write this both with and without a single crossbar. Class one and two writers, other class one and two writers also write it both with nothing in the center and the more elaborate center. There are two hands, 21 and 43, that use all three options. Now I said that although, although all, all of these can vary independently, as I said, there are some tendencies, you tend more often to get the more elaborate center with the more elaborate left-hand arm, for example, but that's not kind of hard and fast. But if we group it by combinations, we still don't get anything very clear cut. The, the very simplest forms, so symmetrical arms, nothing in the center or a single crossbar, class one and class two, fine. The most elaborate forms, two or three strokes on the left-hand side, two or one or two strokes in the middle, all three classes 
So obviously these, what, six signs that I've just shown you are not sufficient to draw any overall conclusions about paleographic group groupings at Pylos. That would require, you know, a complete comprehensive study of, of all of the signs, which as I said is in progress. But I think they are enough to point out some of the kind of problems and the kind of things that a methodology for thinking about this would really need to deal with, which at least in print is not something that has been done yet. Um, and these are, first of all, just the sheer complexity of what's going on. There are complex variation patterns, even within these possible paleographic groupings of the classes, these complexities are added to by the fact that very often different features of a single sign can vary independently. And so whether a scribe uses, you know, variant one or two of feature A has no bearing on whether it uses variant one or two of feature B. So if two scribes share the same version of feature A, different feature B, what weight do you ascribe to that? You know. And of course, individual variation, which again is a normal thing for people's handwriting to do. Um, and we have seen many examples of this. Some writers can be seen to be pretty consistent in terms of a particular feature or a particular sign, others seem to vary. Something that may be quite important to think about here is something that proved to be very important in the orthographic variation, which is frequency of attestation. And in particular, you know, how many texts and how long the texts are that we have that are attributed to a single, to an individual writer. I don't think it's necessarily coincidental that the hands have been coming up again and again in the lists of the ones who show individual variation in these features are hands one, 21 and 41, the key writers of each class because they have the most tablets. And then the other two writers with the largest numbers of tablets, hand two and hand 43. Now, obviously sometimes these writers are consistent even in the signs that I've looked at and sometimes other writers vary, but that's another thing that any kind of methodology for dealing with paleographic variation is going to have to deal with is the fact that some writers are much better attested than others. And if a writer looks consistent, we have to bear in mind that they aren't necessarily consistent if we had everything they'd ever written in their life rather than a few tablets they wrote in a few months. Um, and how far better attested scribes seem to vary, you know, might point us towards how much we want to think that variation in any respect might just be a normal thing for them all to do, but it's very hard to say sometimes. And then there's the existence of forms that are unique to a given writer or, um, or very rare and, and, you know, and, and used only by a very small group of writers. So we've seen this wavy form of ka that's only certainly used by one person, this form of D with the horizontals that is only used by three people and is unique to pylos, lots of variation in the precise form of the, the two strokes in the middle of me, which is quite individual to different hands. This uh, form of met with the curve rather than the backwards S shape. It's used by three writers that we know of and know from, from two different classes. And the form of net with a three stroke left hand arm instead of a one or two stroke, which is used by three or four different writers. Um, so again, if we have a very unusual form that a small group of writers shares, how do you weight that in terms of assessing their similarity against, you know, there being 10 signs that they share features of, but they're all quite common variants. Well, you know, and I don't know, yeah, I don't have an answer to how you take account of kind of how unique or how common a variant is to assess how much you weight you should put on that when thinking about how people, you know, what evidence this might give you for people learning to write in the same way, possibly from the same person. Mm -hmm. And all of these features, I should say, are features that my colleague Esther Salgarella and I have been talking about from a slightly different viewpoint in a paper that we submitted to the volume of the Athens Mycenaean Colloquium, which sadly didn't happen last year, but the conference volume is going ahead, where we think about these things kind of diachronically across the history of linear B and also linear A. And a lot of these issues, so unique or rare forms, that don't necessarily have any parallels at other sites popping up. Um, individual variation, the independent variation of different features of signs, and even the kind of precise patterns of variation that are happening are things that actually often go back all the way through the history of linear B to its parent script linear A. So there's a lot of important stuff here for the development of the script overall, as well as for what's going on at Pylos. 
So I'm going to wrap this up there. I don't have any, you know, kind of firm paleographic conclusions to come to. I have lots of questions and lots of things to think about and that I need to do a lot of thinking about how to develop this kind of methodology. Um, and, you know, in order to kind of try and see whether what we've got with paleography is more like what I think we have with orthography, where actually the variation that we see is just the variation that you get when a whole group of people all learn a script that, you know, throughout its entire history has had a lot of variation and, you know, a lot of signs that look rare to us because we don't have the evidence to show that they were used continuously all the way through, for example, or how much of it might be able to be attributed to multiple training groups who are modeling themselves on the handwriting of different individuals. So thank you very much for listening. Um, there are on the screen various ways that you can um, get in touch with me and uh, find my publications and my blogging. And I very much welcome any questions and comments and ideas that any of you may have.